The movie opens up with a brilliant science student named Zoe, attending a lecture on the quantum Zeno effect at a university in Chicago. A question arises in her mind, but due to her introverted personality she hesitates to raise her hand. After the class dismissal, the professor has a brief talk with her, suggesting that Zoe should take a break from studying, explore the real world and do things that scare her. After that we are introduced to Jason, a stockbroker who is the most popular employee in the office due to his extraordinary work. Following Jason we meet a guy named Ben, who works as a stock boy in a grocery store but aspires to become a cashier. However due to his drinking habit, his boss doesn't let him do that job. Sometime later, the three of them receive gifts from their acquaintances. Zoe receives a cube puzzle from her professor, Jason gets one from a client, and Ben receives one from his boss. They begin solving these cube puzzles, putting in hours of effort and seeking help from YouTube. Upon successfully solving the puzzle, a piece of paper emerges from the cube, revealing a voucher for the Mino's escape room. The challenge associated with it offers a winning prize of $10,000 upon completion. Ben is the first to arrive at the designated location, but he stands outside, dragging on a cigarette. Soon after a woman named Amanda, who also received an invitation to solve the puzzle, arrives and proceeds into the building. The receptionist inside collects Amanda's phone, as mobile devices are prohibited in the escape room. As Amanda steps into the elevator to ascend, another individual named Danny slips in, he too was invited to the same escape room. Danny reveals to Amanda that he secretly sneaked an extra phone in his pocket. Subsequently they both reach the waiting area, where they meet Mike, a truck driver, and Jason and Zoe. Lastly Ben arrives at the room, assembling the complete group. Danny proudly reveals that he is a seasoned gamer, having conquered 93 escape room challenges such as Panic Room, Enigma Basement, Break In, Lock In, Fucked Up, and more. Following Danny's lead, everyone in the group shares their reasons for being there. Mike expresses concern about the potential loss of his job due to the advent of driverless trucks, making winning the $10,000 crucial for him. Similarly, Jason admits that he is solely motivated by the prospect of financial gain, while Zoe has come to confront and overcome her fears. Afterward everyone inquires from Danny how long they have to wait. Danny informs them that the Game Master will arrive shortly to explain the storyline and rules, following which the challenge will begin. However feeling impatient, Ben decides to step outside and drag on a cigarette. To his surprise, the doorknob comes off in his hand as he attempts to open the door. Danny interprets it as the start of the game and excitedly informs the group that it's part of the challenge. He urges everyone to search for clues in the room to unlock the door. Mike discovers a screwdriver inside a book called Fahrenheit. While contemplating what to do with the screwdriver, Zoe aligns the dial on the door lock according to a number inscribed on the book cover. As a result, a massive heater on the ceiling activates. Initially everyone finds it amusing, but the rising temperature becomes a cause for concern. Amanda asks the gamer boy what they should do next. He suggests they can request hints at certain intervals but encourages them that it's more fun to solve the puzzle without hints. Amanda dismisses Danny's advice and begins demanding hints through the reception window. However the window repeatedly echoes the same automated message, please have your seat, someone will be with you shortly. The group decides to break the window to get inside. Danny insists that such actions go against the rules, but no one gives a shit about him. Ben retrieves a fire extinguisher to break the window, but the extinguisher turns out to be made of plastic, prompting Ben to toss it to the ground in frustration. Zoe carefully inspects the extinguisher and discerns that the pin serves as a key. They use the key to successfully unlock the reception window and are surprised to find a minion sitting there with a telephone. Suddenly all the windows in the room go dark, and the light source is cut off. More heaters start operating from all sides, accompanied by a massive fan that blows hot air rapidly across the room. The intensifying conditions trigger anxiety in Amanda, prompting Zoe to step in and try to calm her down. Ben suggests fetching some water, and Zoe brings Amanda a glass of drinking water in an effort to soothe her. As the heat in the room continues to rise, everyone is left puzzled about what to do next. At that moment, Zoe notices a sticker on the wall that reads, Dr. Wutanya says please use the coasters at all times. Zoe quickly rushes to the table and presses down on one of the coasters, triggering the opening of a duct. However it doesn't open wide enough for anyone to pass through. They notice six coasters on the table and opt to press them all simultaneously, successfully opening the duct. Jason takes the lead, exploring the path inside the duct. As he advances, the passage ahead is blocked by a metal grate. Jason asks Mike for the screwdriver he found in the book, and Mike ventures into the duct to provide Jason with the tool. Jason skillfully opens the grate and steps out, inviting everyone to follow. However if all the six coasters are not pressed simultaneously, the duct closes. Amanda struggling most with the heat, decides to go first. As she advances, she starts experiencing vivid visions from her time in the Iraq war, recalling a similar situation. These haunting memories make it challenging for her to proceed further. Meanwhile Zoe comes up with a solution to keep the coasters pressed. She fills a glass with water and places it on a coaster, ensuring it stays down. This works, 
and she heads into the duct to assist Amanda with her haunting dreams. Ben and Danny follow suit by placing glasses filled with water on the remaining coasters. Unfortunately they run out of water, rendering them unable to press the last coaster. Suddenly additional heaters in the room begin to activate, intensifying the heat. Danny blames Ben for Amanda drinking their clue, pointing out that Ben had initially suggested Amanda drink water. In this crucial moment, Ben recalls carrying whiskey in his pocket. He fills a glass with whiskey and places it on the coaster. Together they start exiting the room through the duct, and the moment they step into a new room, the initial room explodes behind them. Everyone is terrified, thinking that what they just experienced was real, and they narrowly escape death. Danny reassures them that it's all part of the immersive experience, and the creators explode the room just after they get out to make them believe they barely made it out before the room exploded. However, Amanda doesn't buy his point and urgently wants to leave. She asks Danny for his phone to call the police, but as is typical in horror scenes, there's no network. For now, they find themselves trapped inside a small wooden house, and to exit, they must enter a seven-digit password on the door. Mike notices a frame on the wall with the inscription you'll go down in history. Everyone starts brainstorming to figure out what it could mean. They attempt entering the last names of former US presidents like Jackson, Johnson, Lincoln, etc., but all the passwords turn out to be incorrect. Ben suddenly notices reindeer decorative pieces on the wall, triggering a haunting memory from his past. He recalls a time when he was driving home after a party with friends, and they were singing Rudolph, the red-nosed reindeer. Rudolph the red-nosed reindeer. Amid the singing, Ben lost focus on the road, resulting in an accident that claimed the lives of all his friends, leaving Ben as the sole survivor. Ben suggests the group try Rudolph as the password, and fortunately the door opens. Upon exiting the room, the group finds themselves in a snowy world surrounded by towering mountains. Danny excitedly ventures ahead, only to collide with a wall because in reality they are still inside the building, and the snowy world is just a projection. Suddenly the cold starts intensifying, and they all begin searching for clues in different directions. Mike discovers a fishing rod above a tree, and Amanda finds a red jacket, while Jason discovers a door that needs a key to be opened. Zoe feels extremely cold, prompting Amanda to give her the red jacket. Seeing this Jason starts to feel a bit uncomfortable for some reason. Meanwhile as Ben walks away to drag on a cigarette, a hole opens up in the ground, and Ben narrowly avoids falling through the opening. Mike begins fishing in the hole using his fishing rod, and Zoe discovers a compass inside the jacket. Following the compass's guidance, Zoe stumbles upon a frozen bear, from whose mouth she retrieves a magnetic hook. Zoe returns to the group, and they attach the new hook to Mike's fishing rod, continuing to fish. Suddenly something latches onto the fishing rod, and Mike manages to pull it up, revealing an ice block with a key inside. They attempt to break the ice block and realize it's no piece of cake. Jason asks Ben for his lighter, but Ben doesn't bother walking over, instead he tosses the lighter on the ground towards them. As Danny moves to pick up the lighter, a hole suddenly opens up in the ground, swallowing him whole and disappearing beneath the layer of ice. The extreme cold prevents him from swimming, and tragically he drowns under the water. Now everyone is certain that it's not a game but a squid game. With Danny gone and the lighter submerged, the group uses their body warmth to melt the ice block. After hours of effort, Jason extracts a key from the melted block, opening the door to a new room where everything is upside down. As they move further, Jason observes a doorknob that lacks a handle to open it. Suddenly a telephone cord hangs from above, and when Mike answers it, loud music starts blaring causing discomfort to everyone. Amidst the dissonance, Mike notices that an eight-number ball is missing from the pool table. They realize that they need to find the missing ball, which will serve as the door handle. Suddenly the music stops, and a section of the floor falls, with Mike narrowly avoiding falling through. Terrified, everyone clings to the wall, realizing that whenever the music stops, a section of the floor falls. Amanda climbs on top of the furniture to search for the ball and discovers a locker that requires a four-digit pin to open. Simultaneously Zoe notices a sliding block puzzle on the wall and starts solving it. Upon solving the puzzle, it reveals four random colors. Mike suggests using the colors revealed on the puzzle on the pool balls and matching each color to its corresponding number to obtain the pin. However the initial attempt results in an incorrect pin. Suddenly Zoe slips and falls on the floor, triggering a vivid flashback of a past airplane crash incident. Jason descends and wakes her up and they quickly retreat to the safety of the wall. Zoe suddenly realizes that since everything is upside down in the room, she instructs Amanda to input the pin backward. Following this, the pin code works, and Amanda finds the eight-number ball from the locker. Amanda starts approaching the group by swinging precariously through the furniture. However a sudden mishap occurs as the ball slips from her pocket and drops to the floor. She quickly jumps to the floor to prevent it from falling. Suddenly the last section of the floor also falls, and Amanda quickly tosses the ball to Jason while being left hanging by the telephone cord. Realizing that there's no way to climb back, Amanda lets go of her grip and falls to her demise. The loss of Amanda deeply affects Zoe, 
but Jason presses forward and uses the ball to unlock the door, leading them to the next room. This new room resembles a hospital ward, with beds similar to those where each of them has experienced a critical moment in their lives. On the beds, they discover detailed accounts of the worst phases of their lives, moments when they were on the verge of death. Zoe's file recounts a backpacking trip with her mom in Vietnam when their plane crashed, resulting in the death of everyone on board except Zoe. Jason shares his story about a boating trip with a friend that went awry due to a sudden storm. The boat capsized, leaving them stranded on a glacier amid freezing temperatures. With only one jacket they were sharing, Jason's friend decided to swim to safety but succumbed to the freezing water. The following day, a Coast Guard rescued Jason. Ben shares his story of celebrating with friends in a new car that resulted in an accident, claiming the lives of everyone except Jason. Mike recounts a devastating event in a West Virginia mine where a sudden blast took the lives of all his 11 colleagues, leaving him as the lone survivor amidst the tragedy. Zoe checks Amanda's and Danny's files and discovers that Danny's entire family died due to carbon monoxide poisoning, leaving only Danny. Similarly during the Iraq War, all of Amanda's comrades died, leaving her as the sole survivor. Zoe speculates that since each of them has been among the luckiest people in the past to survive those incidents, the person orchestrating this game wants to determine who is the luckiest among them, hence placing them in this death trap. Suddenly the TV in the room turns on, providing them with a clue. Jason realizes that within the next five minutes, poisonous gas will be released in the room because all the previous challenges were somehow connected to each person's life. The boiling room reflected Amanda's experience during the Iraq War, the freezing room represented Jason's glacier incident, and the upside-down room mirrored Zoe's plane crash. Now in this room, the poisonous gas that will be released in five minutes is connected to Danny's life incident. While everyone searches for clues in the room, Zoe decides to break all the cameras, driven by a belief that following the rules will lead to their demise. Meanwhile, Jason discovers a clue hinting that they must push their limits to open the next door. In the room, there's an EKG machine, prompting Jason to attempt to check Ben's heart rate. Unfortunately, Ben's heart rate doesn't push the limits. Undeterred, Jason then tries with Mike, but even his heart rate doesn't meet the criteria. In a desperate attempt to increase Mike's heart rate, Jason forcefully gives him a shock and Mike dies as a result. Left with no other option, Jason decides to give it a try on himself, and this time the door opens as his heart rate meets the required limits. As the poisonous gas begins to fill the room, Jason and Ben quickly enter the duct to move to the next room. However Zoe refuses to join them, expressing her unwillingness to play by the killer's terms any longer, and collapses on the ground due to the effects of the toxic gas. Meanwhile Ben confronts Jason with anger, condemning him for how he selfishly killed Mike without any hesitation and with no apparent remorse on his face. Jason coldly responds with survival of the fittest. Mike comes to the realization that on that glacier, Jason didn't lose his friend to drowning but likely killed him for the jacket, as they only had one. This revelation explains Jason's discomfort in the freezing room when he saw the red jacket. Jason admits he killed his friend that day and says he would do it again if necessary. Afterward they stumble upon a door of a bunker, and upon opening it, they begin experiencing hallucinations caused by a drug-like substance coated on the door handle which reacts through their skin. The door bears a message stating that they must find the antidote within the room to survive. Both of them desperately begin searching the room for the antidote, and Ben finds it first. However before he can inject himself, Jason attacks him from behind, leading to a fierce struggle between the two for the antidote. In the heat of the fight, Ben ultimately kills Jason and administers the antidote, putting an end to his hallucinations. Now Ben the sole survivor of the original six, descends through the bunker and reaches the next room. Suddenly, the room begins to shrink around him, and Ben must solve a puzzle to survive. Meanwhile, two individuals in hazmat suits arrive to clean up the poison room, only to be incapacitated by Zoe's attack. Zoe has managed to survive by breathing oxygen through a nasal cannula, and as she had already disabled all the cameras, the killer was unaware of her actions. On the other front, Ben manages to solve the puzzle and reaches the victory room, where the game master welcomes him. He reveals that their customers are among the world's most powerful and wealthy individuals. These clients dictate the design of the rooms based on their preferences and then place bets on who will be the last standing. The game master discloses that the highest amount of money was wagered on Jason, who unfortunately did not survive. Ben feels a sigh of relief that he can finally go home, but the game master suddenly attacks him, stating it's the people who always win not the horses. However Zoe arrives just in time with a gun and kills Game Master, saving Ben. Together they escape from the deadly place, and Ben is admitted to the hospital. Zoe reports the incident to the police, but to her surprise, the place is now completely barren with no apparent evidence of any crime whatsoever. Fast forward to six months later, Zoe and Ben meet for dinner at a cafe. Ben has become a salesperson and Zoe has found a new job. Zoe shows Ben newspaper cutouts reporting the deaths of Mike Jason Danny and Amanda. According to the news, Mike passed away from a heart attack in the bathroom, Jason in a road accident, Danny drowned in a lake in Michigan, and Amanda lost her life due to a fall while rock climbing. Zoe says that the place was designed to make them all die, 
but they manage to escape, meaning they beat the killers at their own game. Now Zoe wants to uncover the truth behind the deadly orchestration and find out who is behind it all. She reveals that she had researched the killer's location, pinpointing coordinates in the middle of Manhattan. Additionally, she had already booked two plane tickets for herself and Ben, to confront the mastermind behind the sinister events and expose them. In the next scene, we see a plane on the verge of crashing, with the crew working frantically to solve a puzzle to open the door and save the passengers on board. However the plane crashes before they can solve the puzzle. It turns out to be merely a simulation in a lab. In reality, this place is the R&D department for the killer, where they develop and test such traps through simulations before implementing them in real life. The plane simulation was a test, and the killer plans to carry out a similar incident on Ben and Zoe's plane in real life, where their chances of survival are gonna be only 4%. If you want the next part of the movie, let me know in the comments. If I get 50 comments, I'll upload part 2. See you in the next video, till then take care and goodbye.